Please open your Bibles to the book of John, starting in chapter 10, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. This parable is the only parable in the book of John. It is also the last parable in this series. So we're all done with the parables. So next week, we're actually going to begin looking at the miracles of Jesus Christ. The parables and the miracles of Jesus are what define his teaching ministry of how we understand what he was trying to get across. And we shall look at the various miracles of Jesus, and that will take us all the way up to Christmas of this year. And so in the book of John, starting in chapter 10, Jesus, if you have a Bible that has titles, it says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus, in this passage, defines himself as the good shepherd. And who, he's, who is Jesus talking to at this time? He is talking to those who pretty much believe. It isn't just the 12 disciples. It is probably a larger number of believers of disciples. It is not uh, the general crowd. This is not the Sermon on the Mount, for example. This is a group of people that are pretty much understanding that Jesus came from God. And so when he says, I am the good shepherd, they know in their mind what a shepherd is. Many of them perhaps were shepherds or related to shepherds. They could walk down the streets of uh, the Jerusalem area and see little sheep pens around because sheep were mandatory for the life of a Jewish person for two primary reasons. The Bible is clear in the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy when the laws are given, a Jewish person can't mix fabric, okay? They can only wear a this or a that. So you cannot have, they would have available to them cotton and wool mostly. You cannot weave cotton and wool together. And so a Jewish person would take the uh, fleece of the sheep and would weave it into a coat and a hat. And if you've ever seen pictures of Jewish people, perhaps at the Wailing Wall or perhaps in New York, they're wearing black hats and black long coats. Those are made of wool, okay? Have been since way back then. And so the shirts, if you were well off enough, you could get a cotton shirt, but you couldn't make a cotton wool blend. Today we blend all sorts of things. We have wool and polyester. We have cotton and polyester and all of these various blends of things that is against the law of God. So if you're following Old Testament law, you can't wear that kind of clothing. That kind of clothing would have to be burned because it is a sin to wear it. And so you needed, as the Jewish people were increasing in number, you needed more and more sheep to produce more and more wool so that they could get clothing. The second is, if you're into the Jewish law, you have Passover primarily. Passover requires a sheep, one per family, and you gotta roast it, and you gotta eat it, and so you had all these sheep producing wool for all these people, and then on Passover, a good number of them would be killed and eaten for the Passover meal, which represented the blood on the doorpost and the uh, angel of God being passing over. And so because of that, sheep were everywhere. It is believed that if you, didn't, if you lived anywhere in Jerusalem or the Jerusalem area or the Jordan Valley, you would go to sleep and you would hear the buying of sleep. Bah, bah, black sheep. You would hear, bah, and you would hear the sheep all over the place. Two things that were done to use up a lot of the land were sheep and vineyards. And so if you go to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago in Jesus' time where there was, where you had to have your food and your drink like right there because there's no way to ship it around, you would see sheep everywhere and you would see vineyards 
everywhere. And so when Jesus starts talking about sheep and sheep pens and sheep doors and things like this, every single person who is hearing this knows, has a picture in their mind, exactly what, they're talk, what he's talking about. We perhaps don't know as much. And so the way the shepherd would keep his sheep is he would build a, a low between one and a half and two foot wall. Okay, a low wall, usually made out of stone, that was big enough to hold the sheep. Now, when you read through the Bible, the largest number of sheep that are in a single fold is a hundred. We don't know if that's just how it was or if there was ordinances or what, but we are unaware of a sheep pen that held 20,000 sheep. So you have a, a low wall, and why do you have a low wall? Because sheep can't jump or climb. So if you have a barricade, a sheep is going to bounce into it and stop and believe they can't get out, even though they may be able to even see over the wall. And there was this round, square-shaped uh, wall, and then at one end there would be an opening, and it would be about four and a half, maybe five feet wide, and it was enough for the sheep to get in and out. Now, when the sun is going down, the shepherd would actually get all the sheep into the sheep pen and then lay down in that opening. And so when the sheep are wandering around, they run into the brick wall, can't get out that way. They run into the shepherd, can't get out that way. They were aware that they can't get out and they would stay in the pen. And so the shepherd, being the door, being laying down in the door, would be aware of when the sheep were restless or trying to get out. They would also be aware of people trying to get in, that they would under, you know, see people, feel people, get the noise of people coming in. And Jesus is saying, anybody that doesn't come in through the door, and you have this low wall, and all of you can step over a foot and a half tall wall. If you did that, then you're a thief. Jesus says you're a thief. The, the, the sense here is that if you are a thief, you're a false teacher. Jesus is the true teacher. You're a false teacher if you try to get at the people of God any other way than Jesus. And when he's talking about it, it says in verse 6, this figure of speech Jesus used, the word for figure of speech, is the same word that is parable in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so that's how we know this is a parable. The Bible tells us it's a parable. And so if we look at what is being said here, the first six verses... Jesus is saying that he is the true shepherd and that anybody gets in another way with another teaching is a thief and a robber. And if we look at the world today, there, is, there are Bible-believing churches, there are Messianic or Christ-believing Jews in places like Ukraine, and that's in the news a lot. There are people who truly, honestly believe in Jesus Christ. And then there's a lot of people who believe in something different, but they believe they're going to heaven. They believe that their way of figuring things out will get them into the presence of God for all eternity with an, a reward in heaven. And if you look at the news, if you, if you study... Uh, how academic publishes things, if you just talk to people. Uh, I still talk to people today about Jesus, wherever I am at. Back when I worked in the tech sector and there was mostly unsaved people in my office area, I was able to speak to them about the things of God. And generally speaking, most people today seem to be universalist in America. They, they tend to be people who believe I can do whatever I want, I can live however I want, I can believe however I want, 
And all roads lead to God. So I can mess around with Buddhism, I can mess around with Christianity, I can mess around with Hinduism and their belief. And it's presented in, in scripted TV shows and it's presented in new shows about how a single view of religion like Christianity is really bigoted and exclusionary and you can't have that in today's society and so it falls to universalism which is everybody's right because everybody has their own truth and your universalists are thieves and robbers. They are presenting people with a false truth. They are telling people you can do anything. You can live any way. You can believe anything and you'll still go to heaven. And Jesus is saying, no, he's the door. He's the only one. He's the one who leads you around. He is the shepherd. He is your shepherd, which means we are sheep. And if you want to know how sheep behave, well, the Bible's full of those sorts of things. We need to follow somebody because we can't figure it out ourselves. Sheep are not bright and sheep are rebellious. And human beings today are not spiritually bright and we're rebellious. And if you read through the stories throughout the Old Testament, you have God himself in a pillar of fire and a cloud appear and ten plagues against the Egyptians and leads them out by opening the Red Sea. I mean, God's glory and majesty is shown all over the place. And they get into the promised land and the first thing they do is make a golden calf. So we are rebellious. We are, I want to do my own thing sort of people. And this is saying that Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the true shepherd and Jesus is in control of your salvation. There are thoughts today that I have to, I have actually heard somebody say, I need to work hard to earn God's grace. They don't understand what the word grace means. Grace means unmerited favor. You can't earn it, you can't buy it. But they're meaning I have to live a certain way to earn God's favor. Jesus is saying, He's in charge of your salvation. We know from other parts of Scripture that it's His righteousness that saves us, not our own. In 7 through 10, Jesus gets very exclusatory. He says, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus is saying, He's the only one. He also says in John 14, 6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As I talk with people, as I read various articles that are sent to me, and it says, well, Jesus is good, but you got to do this, 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 and this, or you got to believe this, 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 and this, and they leave Jesus over here. It is Jesus and Jesus only. If you stand before God someday and he says, how and why are you here? First word out of your mouth better be Jesus Christ because you bring nothing to the table. You bring nothing before God except Jesus Christ. Now I believe Jesus is going to be there I, I have read many things which kind of present the final judgment as more of a courtroom. And God the Father is the judge, but Jesus Christ is your defense attorney. And so he will be there to say he's taken care of it. So, because I don't think we'll be able to open our mouth in the presence of God. But Jesus Christ will be able to bring us into heaven. He will be able to take us by the hand and bring us into the wedding feast. Only Him. 
not Buddha, not Muhammad, not nobody else. Jesus Christ only is the one who can usher you into eternity with God. Then in verses 11 through 13, he starts to talk about how he is going to do this. And he is going to do this by laying down his life. The shepherd is telling his sheep, I'm going to save you by dying for you. And when you, it says in, in 7, uh, let's see, this, in 6, these figures of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying. And I think they really got confused when he started talking about dying for the sheep. And the idea that somebody who is a fighter, someone who is going to fight for you, someone who is going to take you by the hand into the kingdom of God, someone who is doing that is then saying, I am going to die for you. Now it doesn't talk about in this passage what the death of Jesus means. You need to get into the letters of Paul. But we know now on the other side of the cross, we know that the dying on the cross was the only way that God could bring forgiveness of your sins. God gave law after law after law in the Old Testament. And people said, no, 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 in the Old Testament, all over the place. And so to cleanse your sin, to give you atonement, to give you redemption, to give you what is necessary for eternal life, it requires the blood of Jesus Christ to be shed on the cross. What happened on the cross was that all of your sin from the very first one you committed at nine months, all of your sin that you have committed, that you will commit, was taken and the punishment that was given for you, the punishment that is worthy for you, was given to Jesus Christ. He was punished for your sin. He was punished as if he had committed your sin. And it was for everybody in a matter of hours. And so when we look at the cross and we talk about the anguish and the torture of the cross, it wasn't just physical. It was the full fire hose of God's wrath put on Jesus Christ fully and completely so that you don't get it, so that you are not getting God's wrath. And so he talks about dying, and I think that's the confusion part. And then in 14 and 15, he says, I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay my life down for the sheep. If you just ponder eternity for a moment, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were it. They were the only beings in everything for all of eternity. And Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit know each other in an in intimate, infinite way that we cannot even imagine because we've only been around for a little while. And we don't know anybody that well. We may think we do. But the, the love that God the Father has for the Son and the Son has for the Father and that they have for the Holy Spirit, the, the relationship that they had for all eternity is a love relationship. And what Jesus is saying is that that they had and that they have the intimate knowledge, the intimate love that they have is what he has for you. He is bringing you into a relationship with him that matches his relationship with the Father. And that's 
inconceivable. We can't even sense it in any degree right now. We can know it, we can read it and say, well, this is true, but how it works out, I don't think we're going to fully know until we're in eternity, until this is all over and we're standing in the presence of God, Jesus Christ is on the throne in the New Jerusalem, then we'll begin to understand, and it may take millions and millions and millions of years for us to fully understand the love of God. But we'll have the time. We'll have all the time in the world uh, to understand what Jesus did, to understand what God the Father is doing and to understand the love they had for us. Then in 16 he says, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. And you say, Who are these other sheep? These other sheep are us. These other sheep are the Gentiles. Now the Mormons, which is a false religion looks at that and says, the other sheep are Americans. But I think it's all Gentiles everywhere. I think it's everybody in the world who's not Jew. Jesus is talking to the Jews. Jesus came first to the Jew. Jesus offered salvation first to the Jews. After he rose from the dead and sent out his people, Paul and Peter and John and those out into the world, they went to the Gentile communities. They went to places that had no Jewish law, that had no Jewish lineage. One of the first ones, well, the first one that Peter actually encountered was Cornelius, a Gentile Roman who feared God. And then Gentiles began to get saved and missionaries went out. And now 2,000 years later, we're here and we're not Jewish. We're not of Jewish descent but we are believers in Jesus Christ and we are of one flock of the Messianic Jews that are in Ukraine and that are in Israel. We are brothers and sisters with them. There is one flock, there is one shepherd. There is not one God for the Jews and one God for the Americans and one God for the Russians. There's one God and Jesus Christ is the offer and as people get saved, wherever they are in the world, they join the flock and Jesus becomes your shepherd. And then it says in 17 and 18, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, and I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up, and this charge... I have received from my Father. And what Jesus is saying is, He's not a rogue agent. He didn't escape from heaven, and He's coming and starting something new that God the Father doesn't know about. God the Father gave Him this charge. God the Father told Him to do this. And He said, yes, I will. And He came to earth, and He died. And it says He has authority to lay down his life, and he has authority to take it up again. One question that has been asked for as long as I've been studying the Bible is, who killed Jesus? Was it the Romans who killed Jesus? And I think if you look at the words that he spoke on the cross, he took care of his business on the cross, and then... He said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He gave up his life. He has authority to give up his life. He gave up his life and the Father accepted his spirit. And then Sunday morning, it was Jesus Christ who took his life back up again. His body genuinely was in the tomb for Friday night, Saturday and a couple hours Sunday morning. And when Jesus rose from the dead, it was he that did it. It was he that brought himself back to life because he has the authority to bring himself back to life. The cross was not an accident. The cross was not a mistake. 
The cross was not even a tragedy. From Jesus' point of view, it probably was, but from our point of view, it was a great showing of God's love. Putting Jesus on the cross, taking your sin and putting it on him, it was the greatest act of love. And so, what do we do with this? We look at it and we say, well, Jesus is clearly saying he's the only one. He's the door, he's the shepherd. Nobody gets into heaven without him. Nobody is saved without going through Jesus Christ. And then you look at the world and the world says, no, 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 no. There's many roads, there's many ways, there's many truths. Uh, The world talks about Great religions, meaning religions that are old. Uh, The religions that are old are Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, New Age, Spiritism, and Christianity. And our government has actually said in various speeches by various presidents and various speakers of the house that they're all equal, that they're all good, that they're all for going after the same thing. And the world seems to look at religion as a moral teaching, is that you're given a set of activities and way of doing things, and you're supposed to look at the Bible and act that way. And according to the world and the people of the world, The idea that it is just a moral example, that it is a moral teaching, is one of the most destructive views of religion in the world. Christianity is a religion. It is a religion that is the only true religion. Hinduism is a religion. It is a false religion. Buddhism is a religion. It is a false religion. Islam, false religion. New Age spiritualism is a false religion, even though no one can really define what it is. It is still a way of confusing you and getting you away from the truth of Jesus Christ. If you want to be saved for all eternity, it is Jesus Christ. If you follow any other way, you will spend eternity in hell. Those are the two places you can go. You can go to the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ, or you can go to hell by believing whatever random thing you want to believe. The Bible is clear that it is Jesus or nothing. If you want to be saved, it is Jesus. If you want to have your sins forgiven, it is Jesus. If you want redemption out of the depths of sin, it is Jesus If you want to have eternal life in heaven, it is Jesus and only Jesus. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we just praise you for this. We praise you that you have made a way. And I pray that we would be uh, people who understand that there is only one way, and that way is Jesus Christ. And even though the world says that's bigoted and exclusatory. Uh, I, we, it is just true. And so we understand that you are the only way, and it is Jesus Christ who will stand with us for all eternity. Lord, we praise you for that, and ask your blessing on the meal that is coming afterwards and on the remainder of the day. We ask this through the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen.